welcome. This is a talk about Java ransomware, so we're going to lock the doors and I'm going to charge you to leave, okay? <laughs> That's how it works, yeah. Uh, so my name is Steve Paul. I work for Cernotype. I used to work Red Hat, used to work for IBM. Been in the Java space for ever, and I was reminded of just how long that was this morning. Um, I'm going to take you through Java ransomware. In fact, there's a little bit of Java in here, but we're just going to talk about it, what it is, consequences, etc. More than was in the abstract on the, the website, because that was a bit light. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, we'll try and make some room for questions, but of course, just come and catch me. So, I joked about this, but let's be clear, okay? Ransomware is a real crime. In fact, it's a bunch of crimes. It is all these things. Ransomware is robbery. Ransomware is blackmail. Ransomware is extortion. Ransomware is revenge. And, blackmail, bla and ransomware is murder. People have died as a direct consequence of ransomware, of the actions of the people doing this. So you have to understand that this is incredibly serious and it's not going to get any better unless we start do, putting some stuff in place. So because it's a crime, I'm going to go through like that. So we're going to talk about the crime scene, and then we're going to break it down and look at the crime. We're going to talk about the motive, what's behind all this. We'll talk about how they do it. We'll talk about the opportunity. And we'll talk about what actually the consequences are, because believe me, there's a whole bunch of stuff and you as Java developers have things to do. So let's start with the crime scene. So you come in one day, or maybe not you, one of your uh, people running your systems come in, uh, come in and they do something and they find, oh, you've got a, you've got a client, uh, they can't open an Excel spreadsheet. Windows can't open this file. Something weird happens. Okay, that's quite a common way this starts. Uh, and then you, other things like systems won't start because the config file's been corrupted, right? Or files have gone missing. Can't find these DLLs, systems won't start. Xs are missing, jar files are missing, you name it, they're just gone. And then you look a bit further and then you realize that a whole bunch of stuff has turned up that you weren't expecting. And here was a bunch of common file extensions that the bad guys use because they want to be different and they want to make it, it's, make it obvious that this is real. You know, because what's the point of having ransomware if nobody believes they've been, you've been attacked? There are loads and loads of these and they're all related in many ways to the types of attack. Right? But you can Google for this stuff. Then, probably, the other thing that they'll try and do because this is ransomware, is they'll try and stop you signing on. Anybody know what this is? There was this one a few years ago called WannaCry. Anybody remember WannaCry? Okay. And this is what came up. Nice little thing, bit crude, comes up and says, hey, you've got this, this is how you've got to pay, otherwise we're going to, we will trash your data or won't give you the keys. Basically, the idea is I will give you your data back, either literally give it back or give you the keys to uh, remove the encryption. And if you don't, I will keep the data and you will be stuffed. Right? And this sort of thing, this explicitness, it might be like this, say preventing you signing onto a system altogether, or it might actually be there's a file on your system, and here's another real example with some words that say, hey, we look through all your systems and this is what you're going to do. And there will be instructions of how to pay, as you'd expect. It's ransomware, you know? Uh, and they're very explicit. You can get emails with this. You can get files. You can get UIs that prevent you logging in. And then you start reading through what they say they've done.
And they sort of try and encourage you to understand that there's nothing you can do. Okay? I can worry about reading all the specific details, but this is what you get, okay? But the most important thing is, somewhere, there's a link that tells them how, they're going, how you're going to pay. And guess what you get to use? You get to use some form of cryptocurrency, right? And the reason is that there are lots and lots of cryptocurrency options out there that are pretty untraceable. I mean, not completely untraceable, occasionally people get caught, but in general, with the rise of Bitcoin and others, ransomware went through the roof because you can pay them off, you can pay anonymous money to somebody, and if you're lucky, you'll get some keys back and you'll be you know, up and running. Okay. Bad, isn't it? Hmm. Now, the funny thing is, you have to ask, well, how do they get into your system in the first place? What is it? They have to have a way in for you to do that. And it starts with a whole bunch of phishing. Their objective is to get into your system right, and apply some malware, because obviously it's bad stuff, uh, and move on from there. And they will do nice phishing things. They are very clever at trying to figure out which person among your office is likely to be the most likely one to accept the emails, right? And they'll come in and they'll install mail inserts in the uh, system. It's usually pretty sophisticated. It's a usually a little, it's a little um, phishing email that has a little payload that gets into your system that then starts downloading bigger payloads because some of the malware around the ransomware is pretty big and obviously it's not going to be in the zip file that your, your user has just installed, right? They just pulled this stuff in. And again, as you might expect, there are sophisticated frameworks out there already to do this. This is, this is not homegrown in the sense that somebody's writing all this stuff from scratch. Right? We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. Right. So as I said, not your usual phishing. We're all used to getting silly phishing emails. Right? This is one of my favorites. Right? Your ATM card of $10 million was retained right and blah 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 and we know what this stuff is like okay and you go da, 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 bank of nigeria okay so it's just silly right we all get those types of email now the thing is the reason that you get these is because these people are trying to find gullible people so if they set the bar too high they're going to get people who are not gullible and we're going to be suspicious. So what they're looking for is the stupid, gullible, greedy people, which is why you get these silly emails, because they've only got to find one person who goes, oh, I could get $10 million, right? This is not what ransomware phishing is, right? Right? right. You don't get these silly ones. I love this one, right? This is, um, this one says somewhere in the middle of uh, we, this, uh, your fund, which is the tune of $16 million due to past corrupt government officials who almost held the fund to themselves for their selfish reasons. And I'm like, cool, okay, right? But you know this stuff, right? And you would just laugh because we're trained to do that, okay? What you might not get is you might have a relationship with your boss, say. Maybe it's not you, but maybe it's someone in your company who's frightened of their boss. And, and I'll talk about how that gets discovered. And then that person in accounts gets some text from their boss going, do this now, don't disturb me. Okay, here's all the details. And they're frightened and they do that. What you see with ransomware is significant social engineering. They're trying, they will look at you. They'll look at what you're like on, what you say on Facebook. So if you'd say on Facebook, I hate my boss, Oh, I'm really worried about this, that gets discovered. And we'll talk about why you will get targeted later, but basically, this is what you start to get. You get very sophisticated attacks, and this is another real one, where the bad guys understood your business. And they went, hey, well, in this particular example, it was some waybills that were sent to a shipping company. The people who constructed the phishing email on the system knew the business inside out. They knew exactly what they were after. 
They knew how it worked, and so they constructed very realistic phishing attempts. And this one, you open it and it stores malware, okay? Because uh, corrupt a zip or PDF or whatever it was, and the malware's in, a little bit in, pulls its stuff in. That's what you get. That's how it starts, okay? Right? And I'm missing about industry. It's now very clear that they're targeting into specific industries in specific ways. Doesn't matter what industry you're in, somebody has mechanisms uh, to attack you that will be tuned to your industry. And what they wanna get from you would be different depending on which one, which one you're in, okay? And you can see which ones have the most attacks. Government, of course, but you know, it's, it's a real, really, it's not a global, let's just see what happens thing. It's very specific targeting. Okay. And in fact, as I said, they'll even come down to you. If they can figure out, so the, the sequence will be, we want to target a particular industry, find particular companies, figure out which one is the most vulnerable, the whole bunch are doing that, um, which one's got the best, the least security hygiene, et cetera, who've got, find some employees, who's the CTO, find the, the finance um, officer, whatever, blah, 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 do some social engineering on maybe the secretary or the PA or stuff like that, right? And you're in. And that's what's going on, okay? okay. And then, of course, the other one doesn't even require this. It doesn't require them to do any clever phishing. They just use the holes that are in your software. They use all the CVEs. And again, CVEs is just one random example of uh, ransomware getting in via gateway holes. It's, it's endemic, right? We all know what CVEs are like, and uh, that's the other way in, and that's a lot less stressful for, their, for the bad guys, right? What they're trying to do is not only get into your systems through whatever means they have, right? Uh, they're also trying to get into the software that you consume, supply chain attacks. So now we have people who are targeting the open source projects that you consume. So you have a bunch of dependencies, which you have in your POM file, and that comes from open source, open source project. The bad guys are now looking at how they can get into the open source projects and insert malware or, or just other general vulnerabilities into those systems. It's all very sophisticated, okay? And the ultimate aim is really to allow them to do a thing called remote code execution. This is what you see, RCE. If you see any vulnerability that talks about RCEs, then you know it's a bad one, because that means that they can run code. It may be constrained, or it may be completely unconstrained, as in they can run completely arbitrary code, but that's their aim. Everything is to get to that point so they can get the moral equivalent of a command line on your system, or your systems. So once they've got that, then they start pulling in malware. They, you know, it's encryption. So they'll start pulling in, creating encryption keys, pulling stuff in, applying their malware that they've installed in whatever way they're gonna do it, okay? The thing is, this isn't something where you go, oh, something bad's happening. No, no, no. What they do, is that they look at your system and they start working out which files you use the least of and they encrypt them. They look at the files that maybe have been loaded in memory and they'll encrypt the one that's on disk. So everything works fine until you restart your system and then things are broken. Okay, so they are looking at how to encrypt your data and, and as you can imagine, if they're trying to steal your data and encrypt your data, we're talking gigabytes or terabytes of data, there, that's not happened overnight. And in fact, you'd notice if your network went really stupidly slow or your bill went up because people were just downloading stuff from your servers. So it's done in a sneaky manner. It's very sophisticated. And the way they get data out of your system is very sophisticated. They will figure out what protocols you're using Right. They have, we have instances of them hacking your applications. 
to get into uh, in, into the system. So where you make it, somebody makes a REST call and you get back data, hacking those systems so that the REST call returns not just the data that you're supposed to, but some packet of payload that's part of the ransom attack. This is how sophisticated it can get, okay? When you think about this, if you have a million computers out there attacking your system and just making REST calls, and your application has been corrupted and it's just giving out packets of bits and pieces, you'd never notice. It just happens under the covers because you have no understanding this could happen. Okay. So, where are we? So we've said a lot of how they could do it, but why would they want to do this? Okay, well, as you'd imagine, like all crime, there's a bunch of motivations. Data kidnapping, yeah, we're gonna keep your data and we'll give it back if you pay money. Uh, blackmail, yeah, we have evidence that you did something. We looked in your system and we saw you made some dodgy payments. Or guess what, we found all this porn in your system. But that's okay, give us some money and we won't tell them about it, okay? And then revenge, yeah, well it doesn't happen too often, but disgruntled employees, ex-employees, selling some secrets, and that becomes a reason for blackmail. I mean, for, for ransomware, it's just revenge. In those circumstances, they encrypt your system, never intend to give you the keys, right? And then the worst case, and unfortunately the much bright, much, the more increasing case, is weaponized attacks, okay? This is really nasty. So look, uh, I've been talking about these sorts of things for a long time. And when I talked about this five years ago, five years ago, right? We used to talk about this. Organized crime were made about um, 450, $445 billion then. So five years ago, organized crime, we know about the drug trade and all that sort of stuff. You know, you've seen all the movies, people burying money in containers in the ground, all that sort of stuff. Organized uh, cybercrime, um, organized drug trade, 440 something. And cybercrime was estimated about the same, okay? But at the time, the expectation was that organized, crime, organized drug trade would remain the same because it's physical, it's manageable, and cybercrime would go through the roof, okay? And this is our prediction from then, okay? The green line is the drug trade, the expectation that it was manageable, and the expectation was that cybercrime would reach about $6 trillion around about now. $6 trillion, okay? I didn't imagine amount of money. You think about what you know about the drug trade and all the movies you've watched, how much wealth there was, and that's a fraction compared to the prediction. Okay, so how real is that? Well, turns out that ransomware alone is worth that $6 trillion to the bad guys. Can you imagine $6 trillion? You work that in, that's how much that is for every human being. It's a ridiculous amount of money. And that's just ransomware. That doesn't, doesn't there's extra. The total estimate for cybercrime now, in terms of the value to the bad guys, is somewhere between 20 and 30 trillion dollars. Just stupid numbers, okay? But ransomware is super valuable, and it's easy to do, and there are loads of reasons for doing it, okay? Yeah, so because of this, because of the ease of which this is happening, this is why it's growing so much, because you can do it, and you can make money fairly easily without, you know, the likelihood of being caught is pretty low. Okay. But as I said, it's not just about money. That would be bad enough. What makes it even worse is this stuff. Ransomware is also part of weaponized um, cybercrime, cyber warfare, all right? You will have seen Rumors, well, you've seen examples of this now with say, what's happening in Ukraine. There's examples of cyber attacks for, 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 for warfare reasons. And ransomware, it's the weird thing, ransomware can quite often be used as a test case. Because if you're trying to attack systems and you want to prove that you've done it, 
Sometimes ransomware is a good way of doing it because you get to see a reaction. So you know that you've achieved your goal, right? So ransomware sometimes is just that. But it doesn't matter because you pay them off and so they, you give them some money and they just invest it in more sophisticated attacks. So what warfare is about is getting into the supply chain, right? And it's about infiltrating your system quietly for something they want to do later. So it could be electricity systems of your city, it could be the drug trade, it could be the pharmaceutical companies, it could be supermarkets, you name it, some part of the supply chain, they want to get in there and when they need to, manipulate it or terminate it. You think about what happened, I mean if you, so you know, you, you go off to the local fuel store, you want to get some gas, and they go, we haven't got any because the trucks didn't turn up. And that's because somebody got into the supply chain and broke it. And we have real examples of this, lots and lots of cases of this where that happens. Now, mostly, this is trying to be dormant for when it's needed. And as you can imagine, every nation state, every group, um, disaffected political group, whatever, all trying to do this because it's the next thing. That is where we're going. Right? This is totally real. This is not something you can dodge. It's coming, and of course, it's all about part of it's all being about part of the supply chain. We are all part of the supply chain. We all provide services to somebody else. We all can consume services. Right? Okay. Uh, yeah, and I said this. It's this ransom against use as a test case. You know, it's just bonkers. Right. Okay. It's almost impossible to catch people. But we are getting better. And partly we're getting better because they're getting sillier, because it's so lucrative, and groups are turning up who are not as clever. And occasionally we manage to turn them off and get some money back, right? And sometimes they just get forced out of business. But mostly they don't. Mostly they are just very good at doing this. Okay, so let's move on to the means, right? How do they commit this stuff? Well, how easy is it? Well, I've talked about how they can get into the systems. Well, guess what? You can buy revenge as a service. Seriously, there's the top 10. There are a load more out there. People are offering this. You can go to the dark web and you can talk to somebody and they'll go, yeah, yeah, give us some money, tell us your attack, what you want, we'll do it for you. Right? That, it's a different economy, isn't it? That's how real it is. So it's easy to buy it. And whatever your motive is, whether it's blackmail or ransomware or white cipher warfare, there are people out there who facilitate it for you. Okay? Monthly subscriptions. We'll do a one-off for you. Hey, we're doing a special, two for one. You know, this is real. These guys are out making enormous amounts of money from this. And as we'll discuss later, we as developers can often be quite culpable in making this, letting this happen. Right? So it's so cold, it's so demanding that supply chain ransomware attacks have gone through the roof. So I work for Sonotype, we run Maven Central, we have a bunch of security software tools and we do a lot of monitoring of what's going on and it becomes evident recently that supply chain attacks have just gone through the roof, okay? Again, more evidence that this is real, okay? So we're in this new world. The world that you woke up to before COVID, maybe the year before that, it's pretty much evaporated. We now have state-funded groups, it's not, necessarily, not necessarily government groups, but at least funded by the government, very clear, skilled people, I'm sh the chances are there's a couple of people in the, conf in the conference who are maybe involved in this stuff because, well, they've got to get the skills, right? It is regularly exercised because it's got to work and it's so lucrative that, of course, you want to make sure it works. And it is incredibly sophisticated. I told you they are working out how to get into your systems to do things under the cover. You've got very smart cookies out there trying to subvert your systems. And of course, they are highly motivated, right? Super, super motivated. 
So then the thing is, well, what's the ch opportunity? So we've got motive, we've got means, it's opportunity. To get, well, what's the likelihood that they can actually pull this off? Ha! Guess what? It is so trivially easy for these guys, right? So they're just laughing. Right? They used to search for things. It used to be cybercrime, cyber warfare was based on vulnerabilities. And there'd be all this searching and the vulnerability get reported and there'd be a scrabble round to build some exploits. And so you'd have time from it being reported for it being exploited, you know, right? And that's what they did. They waited until somebody, whether a black hat or a white hat found a vulnerability and then they pounce. Right? Well, I don't do that anymore. Now they build their own. They're going up the supply chain. So they look at typo squatting, which is examples of where you've got a dependency, you put a dependency in your POM or you put a dependency in your NPM and you spelt it slightly wrong, transpose two characters. Okay, well that's fine because somebody put up that exact spelling and now you pull down their software, right? Uh, they are uh, doing dependency confusion. There's a whole bunch of stuff around which version, and sometimes we put latest in, and that can get subverted, so you pull down the wrong thing. And the other thing that they'll do, and which is just clever, is that if they figure out that you have some internal software, and they can find that, it gets leaked that you're using, you have your own packages, et cetera, sometimes it's possible to register that package on one of these repositories, and then rather than you pulling in your internal software you thought you'd written. Unfortunately, there's a thing with that name on the external repo that get pulled, it gets pulled instead. Right? This is what they're trying to do. And then there's the two in the middle, open source repo attacks. It is growing and growing that, that human beings are turning up at open source projects and being helpful to secure the ability to be, have committer access or at least be a trusted party do cool things for the open source project and then start to subvert it, right? So we, so we have people turning up and saying, I'll help with that pull request, I'll do that merge for you. And as part of that activity, they do the merge, but they add their own code. This is what they do. Uh, and it could be that subtle or it could be more obvious where people just take over moribund open source projects and suddenly it becomes live, right? All sorts of ways that they are trying to get upstream to the source that you're using. And the build tools attacks is related to that, which is you don't necessarily have to go to the open source project to corrupt it. You can just go corrupt its build process, its build tools, because quite often they're not secure. Or maybe it's your build system that's not secure. Because obviously, why worry about corrupting the, what the source code if I can get into the system that builds the binary? This is what they do. Right? So the effect is, if I put this differently, is that your application Right? Most of your application isn't yours. Most of your application is 90% open source that you've downloaded from the web. Even think about it, you run Linux, that's open source. So your application, everybody else's, right? Bad guys used to look for weaknesses in that open source project, okay? That's not what they do now. Now what they do is that they're adding their own, right? In in the open source code, in the runtimes, in the platforms, in the tools, in the generators, anywhere they can find, they'll work their way in, okay? And they're designed to be hidden. They're not gonna shout at you that things are broken, right? They're all designed to go off when they need to. So again, it's not obvious, it's very devious, right? Now the consequences of this are horrific. People are dying because of ransomware. Uh, there was a classic one a couple of years ago where a patient had to be moved from one hospital in Germany to another because the hospital was, was brought down by ransomware. The person died as a consequence. You know? And there are many occasions where you can see this knock-on effect. So ransomware is murder, right? right? It's not just about the money. It's the consequences of being out of action. So even if you pay them off, right, you don't know that you're going to get what you want. There's lots of, again, lots of examples of things being double encrypted, which is cool. So I, we provide, we encrypt it, you give us money, we decrypt it, 
So you can trust us, and we know that you'll pay. And what do you get back? You are now through one level, and you have another set of software that's still decrypted, and you have to go pay us some more money, which you will do, because you've done it already. Right? Whether or not those bad guys actually decrypt at the end is relevant, because they don't care. They'll do that if they think they can do it to you again, or that they can uh, figure other ways of exploiting you, because as soon as you start paying, they know that you're on the hook. Right? And the cost of recovery for this is horrific. There's really good examples of uh, people going bust, companies going bust because they were ransomed by people who weren't, didn't care. Right? But it's more than just the impact to your business. Ransomware uh, is, has a real effect on human beings. Right? Because naturally, you start poking fingers. Why do they get in? How do they get in? Was it this team? Was it this team? And suddenly the trust between people in your organization you know, gets uh, affected. Right? And it makes you really cross. You talk to people who have been affected by this and they think, oh, I was so stupid. I did this and that was a bad thing. Or more likely they'll say, we don't actually know how they got in, but we still feel responsible as you would do. Yeah? And of course, you've been burgled. People have turned up in your system and done things to you. They've left evidence that they've walked all over and walked around your living room, right? And you can imagine, that's just not the best feeling ever, right? Yeah. And to make this even worse, it isn't necessarily what you think. Again, these guys are sophisticated. They're funded a lot by governments, state actors, it's not only about corrupting your supply chain in the terms of turning it off, it's also about inserting things. So, for instance, let's talk about Equifax. You remember Equifax got hacked a few years ago and there was lots of conversations about the fact that the data had been, all the information had been stolen and was on the dark web. And it turned out eventually that we began to realize that not only they stolen data, they'd added fake accounts. You have a credit rating company, people, and you've now got fake accounts in there. That's really useful. And that's what they'll do. They'll add data. So they'll encrypt it, they'll add data, they'll go to some accounts, they'll change shipping addresses. Imagine how Amazon would feel, or how you'd feel, if uh, all the parcels that Amazon shipped came to your house. Because they're going to change the, the, the address and everybody, right? Okay, silly, but you see, that's what they could do, right? And then even if they do, even if this all works well and they decrypt your data, how do you know that it's the data that you've, that you've got, that it was your data in the first place, and that, that it, it hasn't changed? And they will do that. Okay. Don't be smug. Ransomware is everywhere. I mean, we think as Java developers that mostly ransomware is not our problem because you hear about, oh, it's malware and it's Windows and it's things like that. Well, Windows is great because obviously, because of its design, it's more, it's more open to these sorts of exploits. But Java is still a great vector for getting ransomware in. Just think. There was one from a couple of weeks ago. There's this Chinese hacker group called uh, Deep Panda. Okay, and they go out and hack systems. They, that's their job, that's their profession. And they, are, they use log for shell which I assume you've all heard of. And that was the start. log for shell got them into the system because it let them do an RCE, so they could run whatever card they want. And so then it locks itself, work their way through that. Okay. So it's rootkits. You've heard of rootkits? There's, there are, there's malware installed in your system that you cannot see because it hides itself. It uses vulnerabilities in the file system uh, and also in the OS so that it's in there and you can't find it. Again, it's a, you hear it a lot on Windows. You don't necessarily hear it on too much in other places. But believe me, just because it's predominant on one operating system doesn't mean it's not possible on the others. So this is happening let's say, two weeks ago. But we've got other examples. I was talking to somebody recently about a very similar, where Log4J was a way of getting into a system that was that uh, where they, they installed malware into a build system that was producing firmware for 
I think it was routers or something like that. Sophisticated chains, getting in, using something like Log4j, and then corrupting another system, and then another system, and another system. That's what they do. You won't notice it because they're being stealthy, right? And the thing is, Log4j is sort of like the canonical example for us. Uh, I mean, 9th of December kicked off. I remember, it's my fault. I have to put my hand up and say Log4j is mostly my fault because I work with a security researcher who is always reporting on vulnerabilities and he's always talking about node vulnerabilities. And I said, hey, are there any Java ones? And he's going, no. And then Log4j came up. And now we have um, String Shell. What, and this is probably the bit where it goes, this is your job, right? You can see just how sophisticated it is, how these people are very clever at getting into your systems. If there's one thing you can do, it's around how you change your behavior to deal with things like Log4j. So Log4j is this horrible bug that was added because a group of developers, different sets of people, decided that features needed to be added that would make developers' life easier. And it was the group of these features together that creates Log4j. Every single piece of the, of the pie, of the, the chain, for why Log4j is bad was driven by somebody, a developer, doing what they thought was the right thing. And you could argue it is the right thing to add features to make a developer life easier. The downside is that because we make developers' life easier, we make these bad guys' life easier. Okay? And when it comes then to trying to get this stuff fixed, as developers, we're not really good. We're actually really poor at this. Right? Raven Central, we track who downloads Log4j. We track who downloads everything, you know, the numbers. And since Log4j was announced, log 4 shell was announced, there's been 43 million downloads. And currently, because this is live data from this morning, 36% of current downloads offer vulnerable versions of Log4j. Right? So you may go, hey, well, we fixed it for us, but you sure? Because there's a bunch of people out there that are still actively downloading this from Maven Central, not even from their local repos, from Maven Central downloading Log4j that is vulnerable. We are really poor at dealing with this. So if I was going to give you one takeaway from all this, is get better at this. Get to the point, look at how your systems are built, look at how your dependency management works, look at the tools that you use to figure out whether you have dependencies, go evaluate the tools you use and work out whether they really do what you think. Because lots of tools, because developers, we don't really care about this, so we tend to um, rely on the tools and we go, it's not our problem, so we'll let them deal with it. IT can deal with it. And what actually happens is they, IT buy a tool. They have no idea whether it's gonna work because as far as they're concerned, they've got a tick. Yeah, I've got a scanning tool. Right? But what actually happens is this, is that they invested in a tool that doesn't actually do the job because they didn't understand what success looked like. It isn't just about the POM that you have in your application not having Log4j in it. It's about the dependencies that you use not having Log4j in it. It's about the dependencies that you use that created Log4j and stuck it in a fat jar because that's not in a dependency tree. Can you find that? It's about, the, it's about the ones that just took some of the code. Log4j, the, the bits at the bottom that I said were really useful, well, people have, uh, unfortunately, taken some of that code out and used it other, in other places. So just parts of the Log4j vulnerability, the important bit, is sitting in other people's code. So you, to find this, you've got to understand how you work out what software you've got, and you've got to understand that just because it doesn't say log4j, it still might be log4j. This is the takeaway. Of all the stuff I've said to you, um, we have to be so much better than this. The, the ransomware guys are very sophisticated. Their motivations is, is it's about money, 
but it's this continuing grow, growth of positioning for cyber warfare, getting into supply chains for profit, but also positioning themselves to have massive effects on the systems that you use and, um, and all our lives, right? I, it's a wake-up call. And as a Java developer, there's a bunch of stuff you could do in terms of writing better software, software code. But this, this is the number one thing. Go look at how you consume code. Go look at how you work out whether you have these dependencies. Go write some test cases. Go try, make, go try um, write some test cases. Go and see what Dependabot can find. Go see what um, Maven Dependency Manager can try. Yeah. Go see what Cenotype can do. Go see what SNCC can do. Go see what all these people can do and see whether they can find this code. Can they find it directly? Can they find it in the uh, um, transitive things? Can they find it in fat jars? Can they find the classes if they're copied into somewhere else? Right? That's your test cases. Right? That's your number one takeaway. I can give you lots more, but the number one takeaway is be frightened, go fix this problem. And that's it. That's all I have. Are there any questions? question. Yes. Yeah. Well, I would tell you that historically, this room at this conference has less people in it because people can't find it. So I, you could give that takeaway to the, the organizers. Well, well, you obviously did find it because you're here. But yeah, I, no, I, I, it does bother me too. Um, I would tell you that, I, again, I had a conversation with somebody about this this morning. As Java developers, when I say to you security, what does it mean? Because mostly people go, oh, authentication or encryption. And actually, security is more about how you create software. It's your, do you write, uh, you know, do you have, do you write defensively? Do you understand how you're going to attack? You know, and, and we don't. Developers, we have, as, over the years, we've all been trained to, to not worry about the front end. That's an API gateway. We don't have, the idea, we don't build into our concept and our designs anything about detection, right? Because we just do the happy path and we, we're told to be productive, right? So I agree, I, it worries me that as a, as a community, we're not paying attention to that, but I think it's because we don't understand, A, the situation, that's why we're doing talks like this, and then the second thing is what can you do about it? And, and, and that's the, the next challenge. So that's why I'm keeping this. This one is really simple. If you were to fix the way that you build your software so that you were up to date on vulnerabilities, oh, and let's just talk about that. You don't have any time. Log4j, the other thing about Log4j you should understand is that that's, we flipped to exploit first. It used to be things would get reported, there'd be a, you know, there'd be a fix applied, and the bad guys would take time, you know, 30 days, 40 days to do that. Now, that window is gone. Spring for shell, spring shell, spring shell is another example. Spring shell, uh, it almost got suppressed, right? You could see that it could have been suppressed. There are certain governments that are paying many millions of dollars to suppress researchers' findings. So, because they're so lucrative. And there are certain countries, which I'm sure you could figure out who would be, um, require that any, re any vulnerabilities discovered are reported to them first. Because these are weaponized tools. Right? Anyway, anyway, that doesn't really answer the question about, you know, I agree, I am concerned that there's only, you know, you guys here, but thank you for coming anyway. Uh, yeah. 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 
No, I, I'd say it's the other way around. I would say for many years, we were very careful about not telling you how it worked. And now, because of the way it's working, we are getting, not only are we getting the exploit first, we're getting proof of concept attacks available. Uh, the, the, the two shell ones, uh, there were POCs immediately, and I tried them out as soon as they came out. So I will tell you that um, we are in the worst case possible because they are being used immediately, there are proof of concept available, so anybody can do it, whereas prior to that, we were very careful when we reported CVEs to make sure we didn't tell you how to exploit it. Right? And now that's not happening. Be afraid. Yeah. It's, yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, I haven't got a slide for it, but I will tell you there's a bunch of people who will tell you how they make money out of bug finding and writing exploits. Yeah, uh, so if you get rewarded, financially rewarded for binding, finding a bug, how do you demonstrate that? By creating a proof of concept. And they want to publish the fact that they are a great bug finder. And yeah, so it is irresponsible, but it's lucrative. Can I, uh, and it makes, and honestly, if I, if somebody said to you, that bug you just found, well, I'll pay you $10 million not to report it. Would you take the money or would you, you know, and somebody will take the money, yeah? And then other people will go, well, I'm going to report it because somebody else may pay me more money. And I, yeah, I, I my, 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 my obvious my opinion is, is that this is, really horrible and we shouldn't be doing this, but it's life. And because we've moved from it being a commercial problem where it's just us as developers and companies to it being a, a, a national problem, a state problem, you know, it's now out of our hands. It's been different. And, and there are things beginning to come down the pipeline. You know, there was this executive order last year about um, trying to do something about it, and that's going to have an effect on all of us as it percolates down because the supply chain process that we use, how we produce software, how we consume software, is going to get more rigor because the government's going to get involved. They said, they reckon by the theory by 2024, you won't be able to sell software to the US government unless you fulfill what is turning out to be a really big set of requirements. So there are other things happening, but in the meantime, um, you know, we're screwed unless you start taking it seriously and start doing the basics. The basic starts with vulnerability management, and then the second level is learning how you get attacked, then learn how the systems that you work with work and figure out how your application can be designed to work better with them, right? right? And then finally look at how you actually write code and, and take some of the security defense courses that are out there that teach you how to write better code. Have fun this year. Yeah. All right, okay. Sorry, one more question. Good. I don't really think so. Um, there are lots of tools out there to keep you safe, and there are lots of tools out there to help you understand that you're being attacked. But to be honest, we don't use them very often. Uh, I mean, maybe. I would say you'd be really careful because there's a bunch of snake oil people out there who are selling software that goes, yeah, we can protect you from ransomware. And then you have to say, how? Because I don't believe it. Right. So, yeah, so I think the answer is probably maybe one or two are, are good, but you've got to be really careful. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. If you want to talk to me, I'm all here all day at this, around. Um, but other than that, thank you for coming. <laughs>